Man, let's give it up for Andre and all the song leaders one more time. The title of my lesson here this morning is simply Turning the World Upside Down. You know, uh, if you are a guest here this morning, you come to a very exciting time of the year. Yes, we did just celebrate Thanksgiving, but it's also a time we're digging in the book of Acts, and we're going through our Acts series. And we started it, so we're going to finish it. And uh, I'll be preaching this uh, charge here this morning, and Matthew will be finishing it next week, Sunday. If you haven't noticed, me and Matt switch off every other week, but Matt bailed out this Sunday. No, I'm joking. Um, but um, I I'll be out of town next week, so I took today, even though I did preach two weeks ago. But I love Matthew. So why don't we turn our Bibles over to Acts chapter 16. Last time, I know you guys all remember the last time we studied out the book of Acts, but I'm going to give you a little recap. We left our hero Peter in jail. And that was a tough situation for him. And he got bailed out. And then in the book of Acts, it transitions from Peter being the main character to then the Apostle Paul. And Paul, in Acts 15, has a sharp dispute with Barnabas because they wanted to bring a man named John Mark with him. But Paul said no because John Mark one time left the mission so Paul wanted to go without him. So Barnabas and, Barnabas and Paul went the opposite ways. So then in Acts 16, we see Paul on his second missionary trip. And then we're going to study out here this morning Paul's second missionary trip and Paul's third missionary trip. So I hope we're excited again to the word of God and learn how to turn the world upside down for Jesus Christ. Acts 16, verse 1. Give me an amen once you're there. All right. Nice and alert today. We love that. Verse 1. We see Paul here is going to meet a man, a young man named Timothy, who wanted to turn the world upside down for Jesus. Verse 1 says, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. You know, that last verse is pretty awesome. Where it says the church is so, we understand that the church started over there in Acts chapter 2, 29 AD, with 3,000 getting baptized in Jerusalem. And it says that church grew daily in numbers. But now once we get to Acts 16, it says the churches are growing daily in numbers. So we have a vision. We just don't want to see the Jerusalem church grow daily in numbers. We want to see all the churches all around the world grow daily in numbers for Jesus Christ. Now, the only way that's going to happen if we do point number one, transformation, not just information. I hope you came to church ready to get transformed this morning. I hope you can't just, not just to get some information from the scriptures, but to transform your heart. Look at this young man named Timothy. 18 years young. Disciple of Jesus Christ. Decides that he wants to go on a missionary trip with Paul. And Paul calls him. Can you imagine how exciting that may be? To go with the Apostle Paul on a missionary trip. Exciting for some, scary for others. I think I'll be in between over there. We know from Acts 15, we studied out before, that circumcision was not necessary for salvation. So the question has to come, why did Timothy have to get circumcised? Because we knew that Paul, although was an apostle to the Gentiles, he went to the synagogues first where all the Jews were. And when he would preach there, if he had a Gentile guy with him, 
that was half Jew, half Gentile, that was not circumcised, he could lose credibility. So just for the message to be sent out, Timothy was willing to be circumcised by Paul. That, that, this is it's a, it's a tough situation there. But <laughs> Timothy was so impacted by the scriptures, though, that he was ready to be transformed in any way. There was no limits in his discipleship. He was willing to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything. Was that not the same call we got at Luke 14, 33? When a disciple came to you in that delegation and said, are you willing to give up everything for Jesus Christ? You see, in our church, we're not just trying to give information out. We're not just trying to teach people the word of God. We're trying to help people transform their hearts. So they could too be like Timothy, go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything for Jesus Christ. My question for you this morning, do you have limits in your discipleship? Where is the boundary where it's like, you know what, that's a little too far. I would say this, I mean, this is a little too far. But Timothy was willing to go beyond the limits. You know, it's amazing this year, just look around and see all those who transformed. That it was the word of God that transformed them. To see all of those newly people who got baptized this year. I mean, what a year of miracles. But I think even more special to my heart is some who came with us uh, from San Francisco on the Operation Jerusalem team. And to see some of them transform. And to see their heart be like Timothy and say, you know what, I'm going to do whatever it takes. And there's one brother I want to lift up here this morning, and that's Jacob Beebe over there. I remember the first time I met Beebe, and I was like, wow, this man's an, he's an awesome guy. But he has a lot of work to do. <laughs> and to see Jacob transform, I mean, I love to see the the heart that's been given to us as those who want to do full-time work in the ministry, working a, like Jacob has a, he has a degree from the University of Utah, go Utes, and he works a part-time job at Starbucks early morning, for the morning, and we all did it over there in San Francisco as well, myself, Matt, Regine did it, Selma Ali did it, but to see Jacob go through that and to see him transform himself and transform that ministry over there at USC. It's amazing that he just didn't want to be informed. He wanted to get transformed. And it's awesome to see Jacob Beebe and many others be transformed in Christ in a year of miracles in 2023. It, it, it reminds me of, of a blacksmith. Like a blacksmith, they get all these different raw, unrefined metals. And the metals are heated intensely, hammered relentlessly, and molded purposefully until it transformed to resilient, sharpened sword. But in the same way, gaining information is just like gathering raw materials. But you have to forge those materials through fire and beat them so that they could be transformed. If you are a guest here this morning, we want you to be transformed. We want you to hear the word of God and take me out of the picture. If God speaks to you this morning, make a decision to transform. And as disciples, let's not put limits on our discipleship. But let's not just have information, let's have transformation. And what's amazing was I believe the reason why Timothy was, had a heart to be transformed, because he saw point number two, visions of salvation. Let's read now verse six. It's a pretty awesome passage here. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the world, the, the world in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. At the policy in the vision, we got ready at once to leave to Macedonia, concluding 
that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So here we see Paul go through Phrygia and Galatia, which was now the western part of modern-day Turkey. And what happens is he said that he wanted to go inside these cities, but the Spirit of God stopped him. Now, we don't know exactly what that means or what exactly happened, but we know that this was Paul's desire to go to this part of the world. But God said no, or at least not yet. How about it for us? When we pray to God, do we get a bad attitude when God says no? Or when God says, not yet, be a little patient? Because we do know Paul eventually does go to this part of the world. But God said, I don't want you to go yet. I want you to go to Macedonia. And Macedonia was so far away from where Paul initially wanted to go. So we see that God wanted to stretch Paul's vision of salvation. And I believe the same thing for us here this morning. God wants to stretch your vision. Where you at right now, God wants to take you higher in the year of blessings in 2024. And God wants us to see a vision of salvation. It's amazing to see the vision here where there's a Macedonian man begging to be saved. And God gives the vision to Paul at night. One may ask, well, how did he know it was a man from Macedonia? Well, some commentators believe that he saw a vision of Alexander the Great, who was a Greek. We are not exactly sure that's true or not, but we do know that he knew for sure this was a man from Macedonia. And what's amazing from this passage, which I believe we all need to have a deep conviction on as disciples, he gets the vision. They, then it says, we got ready at once. One man got the vision. And we know that the historian and Dr. Luke is the author in the book of Acts. And it's, this is now called the we section in the book of Acts, where Luke now joins Paul on his missionary journey. But it's amazing what we see from this passage is that one man got the vision, the vision of God. And then the whole church got ready to get behind it. I'm not sure what the year of blessing in 2024 has in store for us. But I do know it's going to be awesome. But the only way it's going to be awesome, if every single disciple here gets ready at once to preach the word of God, just like these men over here in Acts 16. Because there's many in L.A. begging. Many in the West region begging. Many in the Southland begging. Begging God for salvation. But the only way they will see that salvation if a disciple comes to them, that's why it says we got ready at once. But God has a sense of humor. He sees a man in this vision. Let's see who are the first people that got converted in Macedonia. Let's pick it up in verse 11. Okay. Acts 16 11. Our point, visions of salvation. From Troas, we put out to sea and sail straight for Whew, some more thrash. Tough, 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 tough uh, name to say there. <laughs> and the next day we went up to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of the district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath we went outside the city gate to the river. We were expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me believe in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Wow. So I find it funny that he saw a vision of a Macedonian man. But the first person that gets converted over there is Lydia. And I know the sisters are fired up about that. And what's amazing here, we understand that Paul will always go to the synagogue first and preach there. And then when the synagogue did not want anything to do with the word of God, he said, forget you guys. I'm going to go to the Gentiles. But why did he go to a river? Because there was no synagogue in this city. 
So he goes to a river, and where does he find in the river? He finds a woman's Bible talk. Shout out to the woman of wisdom over there. He sees a woman's Bible talk, and he preaches the word of God to them. Because we know God has the vision of salvation for men and women. He preaches the word, and Lydia gets converted. She was a high-powered sister. And what's amazing, if you notice, they are in Philippi. This is the same city where the book of Philippians was written to. So the whole church in Philippi was birthed by a woman's Bible talk. So the sister to find up about that one over there. And it's amazing here, she gets baptized, so her household gets baptized. Then she persuades Paul to come inside her house because she, she was a Gentile. So she wanted to show that, yes, indeed, all Gentiles are a part of the kingdom of God. We need to convert some high-powered sisters in the church. We need an awesome women's ministry. It's awesome to have some great women's ministry leaders like my wife and some Ali over there. And we need to see more sisters come to church like Lydia. Let's see some more vision of salvation. Verse 16. Once we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are the servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to his spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. What an interesting scene. I just imagine this like a small little girl, maybe like five foot nothing, <laughs> just, just annoying. Now she's saying the true things. These are, but just imagine that being on campus, you have a little five foot little girl following you around a Bible talk, it's heckling your Bible talk, heckling your say like, man, these are the guys that are gonna save you. These are, that, that's like, it's true, but chill, I'm trying to just slide in there. I don't want people to exactly know my intentions right yet. Yes, you could be saved, but, and, but she kept that on for days. Imagine the patient. Imagine you, you have a Bible talk, you're like, all right, I'm good. You're like, she's probably gonna leave. She's, there's no way she's gonna come back tomorrow. You come back, she's at Bible talk again. Or maybe in, in your workplace. Or in your house? Can you imagine your front porch, some girl just yelling this? Like, man, this, this person's a freak. <laughs> what happens is Paul gets so annoyed. He's like, all right, enough's enough. And he had the power to drive out demons. And he said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you, come out of her. And that spirit just leaves her. Now, it's an interesting side note here. Spirit leaves her. Now, we know that she had a spirit that would allow her to make money. And we understand that from this passage, the Bible does teach in the, the, the belief of evil spirits and good spirits. And I thought about it where the spirit left her. Where did it go? Now, you could jot this down. Luke 11, verse 24, Jesus says this. It says, when an impure spirit comes out of a person, or in other words, a demon, it goes through arid places seeking rest, and does not find it. Then it says, I will turn to the house I left it. So it's amazing what the Bible here says, that in Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible says that every single person that is alive had a spirit of disobedience. That's an evil spirit. And when you became a disciple of Jesus, that spirit was driven out. But it says it doesn't get condemned to Hell or Hades, it's roaming around. Roaming around the earth, looking for rest. And then it says, it's one day it's going to come back. And continue reading in that Luke 11 passage, it says that seven more impure spirits will come with it. And I was thinking about it, when I was studying this out, I was, I was thinking about it as I was studying over the break. You know, I really try to fight to find rest in God during this break. To pray and to, and, you know, to, to read and have a good time with God. And I thought about it like, wow, you know who's also trying to find rest? Demons. And if you don't find rest in God, the demons will find rest in you. 
that evil spirit has been driven out, but it wants to come back. And let me tell you what, during this time, the demons are knocking. The, the demon of impurity, the demon of anxiety, the demon of depression, the demon of immorality, they're knocking. But we got to find rest in God so those demons can't rest in us. Are you guys with me here? So what, what happens with this evil spirit and this, this woman, they had men that were making money off of her. And they now lose all their income because now this, this evil spirit's gone. So what do they do? They throw Paul and Silas into jail. Let's see what happens next while Paul and Silas is in jail. Let's read verse 25. Acts 16, verse 25. The scene is Paul and Silas are in jail. And we know from verse 25, it is about midnight. Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the prison were shaken. And once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose, the jailer woke up. And when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. Because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for Elias, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Let's stop right there. I mean, it's just such a convicting passage. Here are these guys, they're naked, feet fitted in the stocks. Prior to this, they were beaten to a bloody pulp. It's midnight. They're probably tired, despondent, hurt. What do they do? They don't get discouraged. They don't get down and out. They start singing and praying. Compare your year and your week to this, these guys' night and how you react and how they reacted. These guys were singing and praying to God in the worst of circumstances. It teaches us from James 1, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you go through trials of many kinds, because we know God wants to mature you so that you will not be lacking anything. I mean, the Polito's communion was amazing. To go through that hardship, that's, that's a hard thing to go through. But to see their heart, that, that we understand that there's a silver lining. That one day we're going to see God in heaven. So whatever may be going through here this morning, whatever may be, whatever may be happening even over Thanksgiving break, we know there'd be times where with family, things could hurt. Hurtful times. Just know that God has a resting place for you. And you could be like these men. Sometimes we can read this like, man, I can never be like Paul and Silas. It's, it's there so we can be like them. We can sing songs in trials and tribulations as Andre and Kiana welcomed us with. We can praise the Lord through hard times if we can see the silver lining. What happens is God sees their heart and then he, wants, he frees them. And I know you guys remember this one, but in Acts 12, something similar happens to Peter. Now, Peter was a little discouraged, though. He wasn't singing those songs. And we know from that passage is that when someone's set free and they're in prison, the jailer will be killed, as Herod did kill those jailers. So when the jailer sees Paul and Silas free, he starts to kill himself, or he tries to kill himself with a sword. And Paul says, stop, don't do it. And then he's just trembling when he sees Paul and Silas. You ever been there before when you're so close to death, maybe close to a car accident, and you just miss it by the skin of your teeth? You just tremble. And this guy was just trembling in the presence of Paul and Silas. And then he asks, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You see, he's not asking what I got to be saved spiritually. He's asking physically because he knew his life was on the line. But we know disciples always make the most of every opportunity. And Paul and Silas see an opportunity 
and they preached the gospel to him. Let's pick it up now in verse 31. They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Let's stop right there. I, people will look at this passage and many will say, all you got to do is believe in Jesus to be saved. Well, the Bible clearly says that you got to believe to be saved. But we understand that this word believe is an action verb. By no means is this teaching to be saved by faith alone. It led to action. Let's prove it. Verse 32. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his place, in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately, he and all of his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. So what happens next? This was the same jailer that most likely inflicted the wounds on Paul and Silas. And what is he doing now? He's washing them, showing repentance. And then immediately gets baptized. Why? Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized for what? The forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's no salvation without faith, repentance, and baptism. And God had a vision of salvation for this jailer. And think about it. The guy just a couple minutes ago was suicidal. During this time of the year, people would be the most depressed. Just a couple weeks ago, in about 24 hours, four sheriffs committed suicide over here in LA. Unrelated. Four of them committed suicide. Suicide is the 11th leading cause of death in America. On track to be number one in a couple years. And I've been there before. I were crying out to God the night before I got reached out to by our brother Christian Enos. Begging God, down, out, depressed, looking for salvation. I prayed specifically, can I meet someone that could teach me the Bible? The next day I met Christian Enos. Three weeks later, I got baptized. You know, it's amazing here to see the jailer and his whole family baptized in one night. Such an inspiring story. Probably we could find people like that before the end of the year. Someone that could get baptized in one night. Visions for salvation. I want to challenge us here. We met so many people this year. We shared our faith with thousands all around the Metro Coast. Many of us have so many contacts in our, number, in our phones. Many of us, family members that we gotta reach out to, I wanna put a challenge before the whole church that this week, follow up with everyone in your phone. Everyone. Who knows? There could be a contact in your phone right now. Not at church, begging God for a vision of salvation. And you could be the individual that could be the arm of the Lord. Stretch your hand and help them find salvation. What happens next? Paul and Silas, they come out of prison. In verse 40, they go back to Lydia's house. And they meet with the brothers and sisters, and it says they encourage them. It's pretty nuts. Like, these guys had a crazy night, and they're the ones encouraging the brothers and sisters. <laughs> Talk about great leadership. Let's pick him now in Acts 17. When Paul and his companions had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. This is a pretty awesome thing here. Just a quick note. 
We see that Paul goes through these two cities and goes to Thessalonica. Why? Because Paul wanted to go to the major influential cities first so that they could then influence the rest of the cities. And this is why, where we get our same conviction as a church. We had the Crown of Thorns project. First, our church started over here in Los Angeles, then went throughout the whole United States, and then to key cities all around the world that are metropolitan cities that we believe could then influence the surrounding areas. And we, see, we get that model from the Apostle Paul. Continuing verse 1, where there's a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went to his synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is Messiah, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But other Jews were jealous, jealous of people getting saved. Imagine that. So they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house, not Jason, in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some other believers before the city official, shouting, These men who've caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Wow. And we know King James Version says, These are the men who turned the world upside down. It's amazing to see the impact, the impact of these men. Three Sabbath days, that's three weeks. Three weeks, they're in Thessalonica, they preach the word of God, and they literally start a riot because of their impact. You see, whenever you preach the word of God, what's going to come with it? Persecution. Imagine people being jealous of people being saved. How wicked is that? But we still see it in the 21st century. But what's amazing about this, the church in the first century was not your average church next door. That church was a revolution. Point number three, revolution, not an association. You see, we have the same vision. We want to be a revolution. We, we want to see more and more souls be added to God's kingdom. We want to turn the world upside down. How do they do it? Well, let's read verse 10. Acts 17, verse 10. Point number three, which is our final point. Revolution, not an association. As soon as it was night, the believers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to a Jewish synagogue. Now the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness to examine the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. As a result, many of them believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. We know this passage very well. Over here, we understand the Berean Jews were of more noble character. How is their revolution? Well, the Bible here says that they, over here, had a noble character. And I know that we came here this morning, we want to see, be seen noble in the eyes of God. And we give that 3E e challenge, eagerness, examination, every day. I hope that everyone doesn't have a problem with myself or Matt. You know, I hope you guys like us. Um, hope we're friends. But at the, at the end of the day, we believe that everyone in the church should have a pen, a notepad, a Bible, or a laptop. Some people have, you know, phones. Amen. You use your phone too. It is the 21st century after all. Why is that? Because we want everyone to be noble. It says that they heard the word of the Lord preached by the Apostle Paul, which I can imagine. The Apostle Paul preached the word of God. What a powerful preacher he must have been. But they didn't take his word for it. They went back and made sure it was true from the scriptures. Dare we say this is the greatest sin of our modern day churchianity? Many people flock to service. Many people go to church. They hear a man preach from the pulpit and just take his word for it. To be true revolutionaries, we got to get into the word of God and make sure what we're seeing is actually from the scriptures. What happens after this, Paul and his, Paul's companions are now divided. They go one way, Paul goes the other way. 
And what's amazing for us to be true revolutionaries, we all got to, as a, as a church, we as individuals have to be revolutionaries. And we see now Paul by himself in Athens, Greece. Let's pick it up in verse 16. It says, verse 16, while Paul was sitting, was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Let's stop right there. So it's amazing over here it says that Paul was greatly distressed. In other words, he was angry. He was ticked off. He saw all these different idols in the city. And what does he start doing? He continues reading. He just starts to preach the word of God. I hope that we see the idolatry in our modern day society. The idols that people are bowing down to. Nothing much has changed since the first century. People are still bowing down to idols. Whether it be the idols of impurity. The idols of immorality. The idols of the American dream. And Paul sees all these different idols. And then he sees a statue where it says to an unknown God. And he takes the opportunity then to talk about the one and only true God. And this is where we get that famous verse in Acts 17, 26 to 28, where he says, From one man God created all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that you could seek him and perhaps reach out for him. So although Paul was angry, he didn't let his anger get in the way of the message. He reasoned with the people. Sometimes as disciples, we can get so angry, so ticked off. Righteous indignation has its time and place. But then we lose our righteousness in being right. And how fitting the time of the holiday season we're going back home to see our families. And I've been there where I was a young, fired-up Christian. First day coming back home, cracked open my Bible and opened right up to Luke 14. This is a true story. And my family, they're, they're straight from Nigeria. They don't play that. This was like straight out of a movie scene. I never, I never seen my family this dramatic. And I was like, yeah, that was a mistake. Never do that again. But it's so important that when we preach the word of God, we can't lose our righteousness. We have to reason with people. We have to remember, because why? We were once those people. We were once those idol worshipers. We were the people that are bowing down to the idols. So we can't be hypocrites as we preach the word of God. But we see that Paul preaches and many become disciples. You pick it up now in Acts chapter 18. He's on his way to Corinth. Acts 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reads in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. This is amazing. So we hear Paul now is on his way to Corinth. This is the third missionary trip now. And he meets Priscilla and Aquila, who we know later on are the people that convert Apollos. Who we know later on, Apollos becomes the church leader of the church over there in Corinth. And it's amazing over here, we see that Paul can no longer be full-time in the ministry. And he's now making some tents. And by God's divine providence, while he's making tents, this is where he meets this high-powered married couple. And we need some high-powered married couples in the church over here also. And what's amazing here is that he's making tents, but he's not complaining about it. He's not full-time, not full-time in the ministry, but he's still full-time in the ministry. I know there's a lot of people over here who one day want to be full-time in the ministry. But you got to be willing to preach without pay or with pay. 
And there's one brother I want to lift up who does that in a great way, and that's Andre Sloan over there. Uh, Andre is an incredible disciple, but he's also an incredible leader. He's done an incredible job leading with his co-leader, Keanu, over there in the Single Soul Bible Talk. And they just, I'm on that group, that group me. It's, it's crazy. Like every other minute, someone's saying, I share with this person. I share with that person. He wasn't open. Pray for him. Pray for Larry. Pray for Bob. Pray for Daquan. Like it's like, there's just, there's so much prayer. So many people that they're reaching out to. Because their leaders is a great example of a man who's not in the full-time ministry, but is preaching full-time in the Lord. But then in verse 5, it says when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself. So we need to understand the call is that we do need some more full-time ministers in the Lord. And that's what contribution mission is all about. Like, you have to understand, all the people, are, they're getting their souls saved. And we're about to see Adonis get baptized into Christ here. Whenever we're putting more people in the full-time ministry, isn't it awesome when people get saved? Was, were you so happy when you got your soul baptized? Isn't it amazing that we've seen so many souls get their life right with God? But we can see more if we have more people full-time. It was the plan of God to have full-time ministers. We understand that Paul, now he gets the money, now he's full-time. And in Luke chapter 8, the apostles are full-time by the woman selling their jewelry. How about that, sisters? There's some sisters like that. Selling their jewelry to put the brothers full-time in the ministry. I know you guys are fired about that one. Verse 6. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. For now I'll go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justice, a worshiper of God. Chris was a synagogue leader and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believe and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I'm with you. And no one's going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city. You know, stop right here. We're going to have to skip through Acts 18 here, but I, I just find this so encouraging. Here, the Apostle Paul, I mean, you guys think about this guy's life. Like, we think we're getting persecuted. This guy was getting stoned, beaten, threatened, eventually gets beheaded. Just imagine that's like your average day. Like, it's not like it happened like once in a while. Like, this is like another day in the office for Paul. That will get to any individual. But every single one of us has trials and tri tribulations that are real to us. That is a lot for us. That might be a daily struggle. What was God's message? I'm with you. No one's going to attack you and harm you. Keep on speaking up. For I have many people in this city. You see, God wants you to understand that he's with you. As long as you're doing what he's calling you to do. That's the great commission. Go make disciples. Baptize them. Teach them obey. And I'll be with you to the very end of the age. It was the way God comforted all the men of old. To Joshua said, I am with you. To Moses said, I am with you. And to you, he's saying, I am with you. But sometimes when we come to the end of the year, we could look at the past and maybe not be so fired up because we didn't achieve what we thought we were going to for the Lord. But God says, just keep on going. I am with you. Don't stop sharing your faith. For I have many people in this city. You see, God has many people in Los Angeles. They just haven't been baptized yet. But we're going to find them. And we're going to see one day, not just the city of angels get to a thousand for the Lord. One day we're going to see the metro coast get to a thousand for the Lord. And thousands upon thousands will worship God. Continue reading on Acts 18. Apollos gets converted. Then Acts 19, let's turn over there. We see from verses 1 to 7. 
Paul gets to Ephesus. And this was, this, this was a part of the, the, the place in Acts 16 where God said, not yet. But now he's in Ephesus preaching the word of God. He finds 12 men that did not know of the baptism of Jesus Christ. So he baptizes them. And then they give birth to the church in Ephesus. And let's see what did, what did they do to build that church. Acts 19 in verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took disciples with them and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. It's awesome. So over here what happens is Paul gets those 12 guys. And it says they have daily discussions in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And it says, so that in two years, everyone in Asia Minor heard the word of the Lord. Asia Minor is bigger than the whole state of California. And it says, so that in two years. I think what the scripture is saying is that Paul and his companions, those 12 guys, they built the team in two years so that they can evangelize all of Asia Minor. And it's pretty awesome that Matt and I have been here for now almost a year. Next year, by this time, be almost two years. And that's our vision. We want to build the structure and the foundation of the church here in the Metro Coast so that in two years, we can have that team and then go on and evangelize all the Metro Coast. Yeah. But what is it going to take? Well, one, us relying on God. Number two, hard work. Number three, hard work. Number four, really, really hard work. That's what it's going to take to build a church. There's no way around it. That's how they did in the book of Acts, and that's how we're going to do it here in the 21st century. So what happens is Paul is, has a cranking Bible talk, and I think it's just something to point out. Just imagine if you were the only Bible talk in the city of angels. Your Bible talk. Would you get the job done? Paul did. And we got to imitate our brother Paul. Verse 11. Let's close it out here. Begin to close out. It says, God did extraordinary, extraordinary miracles through Paul. So even the handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Wow. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who he didn't possess. They would say, in the name of Jesus of whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, Jewish chief priests, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating. They ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now come and openly confess what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. You know, another interesting, almost funny scene. Where we see what happens is the, the, the ministry of Paul was just growing so exponentially and in power and effectiveness. Some people try to impersonate. So see, they impersonate and not imitate. And that's what we got to do. We have to imitate the faith of our leaders, not impersonate them. Because what happens here is they try to impersonate Paul and then that demon gives them a beating. And what's amazing about this, what we see and again, the Bible says don't mess with dark forces. I remember, I remember one time in San Francisco, and there was a guy who was about to get baptized, and he gave a speech and said, you know, I heard that Satan's going to come after me. And then he goes on and says, well, bring it on, Satan. And I'm like, what? The guy fell away in a month. We don't mess around with the dark forces. We don't mess around with it. Because we understand that, yes, God is bigger, but you without God, you are weak. I am weak. Without God, we can't do anything. They will overcome us. And that's what happens to these guys. But everyone hears about it. And, and, and they, 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 they hear that the demon said they know Jesus and they know Paul. That's powerful. The demons knew who Paul was. That's how effective he was. And what happens is 
sorcerers. They get their scrolls, they burn them. And they estimate the cost as about 50,000 drachma. In our modern day currency, that's about half a million dollars. So imagine, for Jesus, Jesus said, hey, give me half a million dollars and burn it. That's what they did for Jesus Christ. And we're like, man, that's, that's, that's crazy. But that's what we do every time we give our special missions. We're giving it as an offering to the Lord. By this time in 2023, the Metro have we've raised, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars for missions. And it's funny, we talk about mission season. It's, it's, never, it's always mission season. Because God's always in a special mission. And I want to put before us that we have to be like these men here who just gave, gave it to God. And let's blow out our special missions. As Matthew did a great job with contribution today. For God so loved the world, he gave. We cannot have a revolution without a great contribution. And we want to see a revolution here. But we got to continue to give. That's what revolution is all about. You know, it's amazing over here. We see that Paul continues to do amazing things, but then more persecution comes. And there's a riot. And then we pick it up in Acts 20. Paul preaches all night. And there's a clock watcher there named Eutychus. And he falls out and dies. And I hope there's no clock watchers here <laughs> as I'm preaching. But if you were in Paul's church, you'll preach all night. And then what does Paul do? The guy dies. And then he goes and he resurrects him <clears throat> from the dead. And then he keeps preaching. <clears throat> Talk about a guy who was not concerned about clock watchers. Super secure in his preaching there. But then what happens is Paul then goes on. He's on his way to Rome. And Matt's going to close that out next week. But he gives a feral speech to those elders in Ephesus. Most likely those guys over there in Acts 19 that he baptized. But let us close out in Acts chapter 20, verse 22. Our title was Turning the World Upside Down. We talked about transformation, not just information. We talked about how God has a vision for salvation for all mankind. And our final point was a revolution, not just an association. And I believe we want to see all those, heart, all those things come true. We got to imitate the heart of Paul in Acts 20, verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. Not knowing what happened to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race. Complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. What amazing hearts. Imagine a church where every single disciple had that heart. I consider my life worth nothing. My only aim is to finish what God started. You see, what God did at the cross, he paved the way so we could be saved. But the same man who's the orator here writes that from that cross, there's still work to be done. Now it's time for you to take up your cross. To finish the task, complete the race, and testify God's grace. So that one day we can say the same thing that was said about the church in the first century. We too turn the world upside down. And to God be the glory.